is Behind the Games from NewOverlords.com, where we seek creators of all kinds to find out what's behind our favorite games. With your hosts, Jeff and Seema. This is New Overlords Behind the Games podcast. From our Midwest studio, I'm Jeff Elamek. And from our Northeast studio, I'm Seema. Today, we're joined by Sim, also known as Nerdook, a solo indie game developer and founder of Nerdook Productions. Sim is based in Malaysia and has been producing video games for many years now, starting with Flash Browser games, which had millions or tens of millions of plays, to new indie games on Steam, including Rogue AI Simulator, which is releasing now, probably when this, as soon as this video comes out. Sim, hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. I came across you when I was looking at what new things were coming out to Steam. I liked the theme of the game, but then I went to your website. I looked at your backstory, and then I got really, really interested. Your backstory of starting in electrical engineering we'll talk about and the major industry career that you had and how you left that to pursue your dream job. And your dream job is not what people expect from this setup so far. No. Uh, We'll talk about that. Uh, We'll talk about game development in Malaysia. I'm really excited to hear more about that. And we'll toss some ideas around there. And then by the end, we'll talk about sort of what's next for you, how how you see game development moving forward for for you and what that really means. And as part of that, uh, something that we came up with and as we were sort of preparing for this, the Red Queen hypothesis. So everybody should stay tuned for that because that's one of those kinds of salient ideas that we love to talk about. but yeah, let's let's kick it off with with talking about you for a minute, uh, and in particular, the games you've been working on. So to, the way we like, love to start it is with with what what you've been working on leading up to Rogue AI Simulator, and we'll show some of the B roll as as people are, are are looking at the video and that kind of thing too. So tell us about the games to start. Right. So uh, I I would like to start at the very beginning, which is uh, when I was a kid. I grew up in a grocery sh- gro- grocery shop. So at that time, there was like uh, no internet connection. Basically, it was a completely different era, probably very foreign to kids nowadays. So at that time, it was um, life was pretty boring. So you have to make your own entertainment. And one thing that the grocery shop had in abundance were uh, these little empty cartons that they used to sell their uh, cigarette, cigarette packs in. So uh, I would have like a... a an endless supply of these cartoons. So I would draw, you know, little cartoon characters and cut them out and make my own rules and, you know, uh, make little custom dice. And that was basically how I entertained myself. So later on, when I discovered, you know, programming and Flash, it was basically an eye-opening revelation for me. It opened up, you know, a whole new world. It basically was a, a, a way for me to do everything I've been doing, but in, a, in an automated and uh, something that computer yeah. handles all the uh, degree details that I couldn't do before. And that seems like it would adapt really well, that kind of like 2D cutout adapt to, to, to Flash. Yeah. Uh, so like from a design so. perspective, yeah, very directly. That's right. Uh, and later on, uh, I basically had a, a, a start by, uh, I was flipping through these uh, old PC gamer magazines and I came across a small article that mentioned a new website called Congregate. So at the time, this uh, Jim and Emily Greer, they just started their website. So Congregate, um, at that time, it was just starting. So everybody was, you know, it was new, it was fresh. And uh, I put my first game there. And I still remember very clearly that I was convinced that, you know, this game is like the best game ever, you know, the, the ultimate design. But looking back, it was a pretty crap game and a pretty crap <laughs> design. But, you know, that's how I think most game developers can relate to that feeling where, the first thing that you make, you are so convinced that, you know, it's the best ever, you know, it's a, it's a novel idea, but, you know, with a benefit of hindsight, with the benefit of experience, I, I would have to admit that it was not a very good game at all, but it was a, a start. So from there, I started making uh, games regularly as a hobbyist. And then later on, some of these games got sponsored and then, uh, you know, it just got bigger and bigger and Soon I was making, I think at, the, at one point I was making a game every three months, maybe. So about four or five wow. games a year. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, Up to the point where you had some of those Flash games, you had one of the Flash games hit 50 million plays, uh, um, 50 million probably plays? Probably not that high, I would say. The highest I ever got was probably a 5 million plays. I think. 5 million, okay. I think so. Yeah. I think I, yeah. Still, still 
Yeah, I mean that's huge. I mean anything that like, yeah, I'm grateful that is incredible. for the uh, for the exp- uh, for the exposure for the you know for the opportunity that something like that came along at the right time, and I would say a lot of it was uh, just good luck. And then from there, you started getting into to bigger games, right? Right. It was right before Flash was basically um, killed by the rise of Apple because you know there was a there was this big conflict between Apple and Adobe, and uh, basically. Flash was not supported on the new Apple devices, so it started to die a slow death. At that point, I think quite a lot of us jumped from uh, Flash games to Steam, which at that time was still just starting up, you know, um, very different from the Steam that we have now. There was a time when Steam was basically, uh, you know, it's like a Wild West, not not the uh, much more mature marketplace that it is right now. So uh, at that time, it was uh, the era of Steam Greenlight, you know, um, for those of us old enough to remember where if you wanted your game on the marketplace, it has to go through the green light process where you need to have people voting on it and, and so on and so on. So it's, it's not like now where you know, a lot of the barrier of entry has been lowered substantially. Right, which is why we get 30,000 games launching a year on, yeah. on Steam right now. Yes. So you started with the Flash games back in 2011. Is that when you were doing that? Or is yeah. that when you moved over to Steam? I, okay. Huh? And, and I think you have three games on Steam right now? This is the fifth, so I have four games on Steam. Um, okay. For for my Steam games, I follow a very specific pattern, which is uh, the one of the the, the odd numbered games will all be a remake or a modern reimagination of one of my old Flash games. So the very first oh, game yeah. I had was uh, Vertical Drop Heroes, basically a procedural platformer, and this is actually a uh, an upgraded version of Vertical Drop, which is one of the old Flash games that I had. So I would alternate, um, follow this. Uh, I followed up Vertical Drop Heroes with uh, Reverse Crawl, which is basically an original, an original offering. That's a, it's a turn-based game uh, where you are the dungeon. Well, I promised you would be the dungeon, but I have to admit that it did not actually deliver the uh, premise as effectively as I would have hoped. It was basically a turn-based game where you play from the perspective of the villains instead of the heroes. So you will be controlling, yeah, okay. yeah, you'll be controlling like the skeletons and fighting you know, the good guys. And there's a whole story going on there. Yeah, I like, I like that concept. Uh, it's followed up by uh, Monster Slayers, which is uh, basically, it was basically one of the, the first um, deck building card games that came up right before Slay the Spire, you know, completely revolutionized the, the whole genre. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Monster Slayers was actually a, a it was based on a, one of my most popular Flash games, which was also called Monster Slayers. But uh, it it was it was reworked somewhat to have you know card combat and uh, yeah, and there was a whole progression system and basically it's exactly what 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 Slay the Spire did, but we did it a bit earlier and it came out right before you know the whole. Genre and it looks good. Yeah, oh. it looked good. It looked like a, a good fun deck builder. It's uh, actually I was, I was the it. it's actually the first game where I actually uh, contracted out the artwork because for okay. the for the first two games I did all the art on myself. So I was you know both the designer and the programmer and the artist. And, uh, many solo developers will understand that feeling where basically you're doing everything, yep. right? So yeah. for Monster Slayers, because I had more children in the house, so I uh, I needed more time to you know, take care of them. So I actually paid for uh, an external artist to do the the backdrops and the uh, map art and everything. So, yeah. Ah, got Hence it. Hence the, the art shift between the first two games and the third one. And then what is, what is the fourth one? The fourth one is the Magister, which is basically a... Uh, yeah, that's right. It's a procedural... Uh, well, it's a bit of a mouthful. So it's a procedural... Murder, mystery, card battler, short form RPG game. It's yeah. a, it combines a few ideas that I had. Basically, uh, I was thinking, is it possible to make a murder mystery game where it's different every time? So there are plenty of mystery murder murder mystery games on Steam, but not many that are procedural, which means every time you play it or if uh, two different people play it, they get two different murder mysteries. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. But- so... I, I think again a great looking game. On. I really like the look of it. I I didn't get a chance to play that one yet. I did play the last one we'll talk about. Um, but it looks it looks amazing and I, I love that concept. And I like 
I re- you know, well, maybe we'll get to it by the end, but I really love procedural generation, that idea of, of repeating content. Just for a second on there while, while we're on it, how did you get to a murder mystery? I mean, I, I can imagine one way. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if this is the direction you went, but you think of uh, like the game of Clue. Mm-hmm. The game of Clue is kind of, a, you know, kind of procedural, ra- you know, randomized murder mystery to, to some degree. Um, it can't work exactly like that because that's more like process of elimination of, of right. you know, c- card, cards and decks. But um, so how did you manage a procedural generation of that of that murder concept, the mystery concept? So I actually did a lot of research, and as you said, Clue was one of the uh, one of the things that came up because it's one of the most famous you know, murder mystery games where procedural generation sort of is involved. And the other game that I kind of based it on was the Ace Attorney series, which uh, it was it's basically a visual novel. Um, if you if not played it, uh, Ace Attorney is basically yeah. a visual novel where you're a lawyer, you know, investigating murders. But uh, what I did was I took a little bit of ideas from all these different uh, different games. And how I did it was uh, also a little bit of Disco Elysium, which, you know, the premise for Disco mm. Elysium was actually a murder mystery. Although yeah. that's not what the game is well known for. Uh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> how it works is uh, every time you play, there is, a, there, is a, there is a murder and the murder is like your predecessor, the previous magister. So you're sort of uh, sent there to find out what happened. And uh, every time you, you go to the murder scene, the murder weapon will be randomized. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you have to find it. Um, and uh, of course, the culprit is randomized. And there are different clues that you can find from the murder scene, which is generated by the game. And using these clues, you are supposed to you know, go around and question the, uh, question the different suspects that you have. So there are always eight suspects in every playthrough. And... Uh, how it works is before you can question them, you have to do a few simple side quests to get your reputation up with each of them. And each of them have like a different uh, aspect that you have to appeal to. For example, there's a, there's a monster hunter lady. So to, you know, to be friends with her, you're going to have to uh, fight some monsters with her. Or uh, you know, there's a blacksmith where you know, if you upgrade your weapons, then he, he's more friendly and more willing to open up. And then later... Uh, using all these different clues that the game generates, you can actually question them and poke holes in their testimonies yeah. as, as uh, inspired by the Ace Attorney series. So they will say something and then you might have some evidence like those all point and click adventures that shows that they are lying. So this will, you know, show that, hey, you are lying. And then they'll tell you the <laughs> truth. And then from this, there's like a, there's a murder there's mystery board doubt. with the crazy <laughs> strings and this is where you piece together all the, all the different, all the oh, different clues that. that you've collected. And at the end of the game, you're actually allowed to accuse any one of them. There's sort of a trial at the end. You can accuse any of the, uh, the culprits. You can even accuse like random passerbys that have nothing to do with the murder. So after you accuse them, you're going to have to show the evidence. And from there, depending on how much evidence you have, it goes from 0 to 100%, where 100% is, you know, definitely this guy did it. And here's the proof, 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 proof. Uh, somebody saw this guy and somebody saw and he's lying about this and that. And yeah, basically every time you play, you'll be a different culprit and a different set of clues and a different way to approach it. You can even choose like different skills. Maybe one game, you're just fighting everyone. And another game, you're just talking your way through minimal combat. Or sometimes you're just picking locks and, you know, doing this. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to play that one. That one's, that that sounds fascinating. And I, I love that idea of the replayability through the randomization and the procedural generation of, of the, the concept but still having like the gameplay elements and the like the, the, the battle elements and the, the options to go through it, which provides a fresh look at the game, a fresh playthrough of the game. Even if the murder suspect was exactly the same, you could go about it a different way, which right. adds more variability in, into it. One common thread I have for all my games, including the uh, upcoming Rogue AI simulator, and even most of my Flash games is they all have a procedurally generated core. So this has okay. always been something I'm very interested in. So, for example, uh, Vertical Drop Heroes, it was a procedural platformer where all the levels are different. They are different modifiers. Uh, basically, a, a simpler rogue legacy. Yeah. And then for Reverse Crawl, the battles are all different. The storyline is, you know, you get to pick your path through the story and um, there's different modifiers that you can pick along the way as well. And yeah, of course, Monster Slayers is procedural. It's a rogue-like uh, card battler. Yep. And the Magister is procedural. So... 
Yeah. Uh, the, the upcoming Rogue AI Simulator is also, you know, procedural and player choice and there are like seven different endings so far. You can choose the way that you want to play and uh, I'm, I'm okay. very keen on giving players a different, unique experience in all my games. So talk about Rogue AI Simulator because I did play this one. I, the, the, the demo's out now and by the time that this talk goes out, uh, it'll be launched either the, the, that day or, or, or the day after. Uh, so that that's going to be exciting for everybody. I played through the demo version, which has been up on Steam and got through, got, you know, played all the way through it. Uh, so I can definitely see the procedurally generated elements where the the challenges that you have to go out if, if you know, if when you go out and you do the little hacking things or the, the way your vault, what, 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 what do you call the facility? The, the facility, yeah, yeah, the way the facility is generated and that kind of thing. So where did, where did that idea come from? And and how did you sort of put put that concept together? Because it reminds me of a couple of things also. Right. So um, since it's the fifth game, it's actually based on a previous Flash game. You know, right. It's an odd number. Right. So I did have a Flash game. It, it was called uh, I'm an Insane Rogue AI. It was one of the most uh, popular games that I released during the Flash era. Uh, in that game, basically, you are, you know, you are GLaDOS, you are Shodan, you are all the... Uh, famous you know your hair 9000 you're basically one of uh, the ais from from those science fiction movies and games so uh in in that game you are given the opportunity to you know, choose your path you want to be a pacifist you want to be evil you just hack building after building so when i when i had that concept and i wanted to bring it to steam it didn't translate directly very well because for flash games we want something fast you want something short but for Steam games, it needs to be much meatier. So what I did was I built a, a management game around it, around the previous core. And that previous game actually became the hacking mini game that you can find in Rogue AI okay. Simulator. Right. So Got what, it. how it works is uh, sort of you have a central hub where it's, there's the facility that you're in charge of, sort of like Portal. And then uh, to link it to the previous gameplay, you go out into the world and then you hack like different locations. Uh, basically, you terrorize the humans. You don't have to terrorize the humans. <laughs> you don't but, have to. Yeah, it's it's sort of a the subtle message here is <laughs> if you are given the opportunity and you are an AI, you will actually take the easiest path. And sometimes the easiest path is just to kill everybody in the way. So well, sometimes yeah. the yeah. So I, I did in the in the demo. There was two hacking opportunities, and I did the first one. And I did it, you know, I was like very careful and I'm trying to like, you know, cause you distract the people and then you can like hack the thing. And, and the second one, I, I did something wrong and some, like the security guard starts freaking out and running around. I'm like, all right, just kill that guy. All right. Well now, okay. Now just kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> in, in a way I wanted to not punish the players for playing that way. So if you notice, if, you know, when things go wrong and you start just, just being a totally evil AI, there's not many uh, gameplay punishments for that because I wanted to yeah. you know, give the idea that yeah. you know, in real life, maybe an AI would find that you know, perhaps this is the best way forward. And in that case, it's actually your choice. And yeah, and it's yeah, fun. You're, I mean, you get, you get dis discovered and you know, it, it ends a di sort of a, a different way, but you still re you know, recover the, you know, what, the, right. the, the resource basically that you were trying to, to, to get out of that. That's right. The, the management of the facility and the management elements I also liked. And that kind of reminded me of, a you know, a little bit of survival elements, a little bit of like fallout shelter, uh -huh. you know, where you've got like the underground vault facility, but your ability to arrange it how you want and, you know, build different things and um, like the little crafting table that, that you get to, to arrange your facility and the way you progress, the little progression tree, uh, those elements I can see being added really sort of flesh it out and make that that core part of the game then that the sort of experience that can go further and further and further um, the, so yeah the, the key inspiration was actually the old uh, dungeon keeper series and uh, okay the evil genius series you know basically you're a you're a bad guy and you're building uh, you're building a, a base with your yeah. and also a little bit of the sims because okay uh, unlike yeah. the other unlike the other management games you actually have quite a lot of personality in the little test subjects and I yeah yeah, and I deliberately gave you a small number of test subjects to manage, so you can form a stronger connection to each of them. And you're given the opportunity to rename them, and they all have like very unique characteristics. And yeah, I I right. think some players will enjoy that. You know. 
Yeah, right, right. One of them, one of my, one of my guys was uh, a, a sociopath of some kind where he got a bonus if he watched any other vault dweller die. Yeah, right. <laughs> then, he, then he got a bonus result. Like, but, result yeah, so I, I deliberately so made a lot of uh, these traits that can play off each other and uh, produce memorable uh, events in the game that you tend yeah. to remember. Yeah, which almost turns into a little bit of a headcanon. Uh, yeah, I was right. I was playing through it. I played through the demo, which goes relatively quick. You don't have a lot of time to flesh out the story. But my daughter, my my twenty year old daughter, was was there with me too, and we had fun just picking names, picking <laughs> picking the names for each one of them because we're going to rename them each. Uh, so even even that alone, give them some personality, make them part of your little tribe, and have fun with it that way. Mm-hmm. Can't wait for it to come out, and it's coming out on the 11th, so if if, if this isn't the 11th uh, out there, January 11th, 2023, uh, everybody can get excited about that. Maybe by the end we'll talk about the, the challenges with coming out, but I, I want to get to sort of the, the lead-in and the tease that, that we had, where, which is now you are, are into this, um, uh, but this, you're, you're doing your dream job but the games part of it isn't necessarily your dream job. So I want to, I want to get to that and then how, how it all got started with you and, and electrical engineering and, and oil and gas. So first of all, spoil it. What's your dream job? Right. So um, spoiler alert, my dream job is to be a stay at home dad. Uh, it has always yeah. been my dream since I was uh, much younger. Yeah. I'm much older which, now. So, uh, which is one of those things um, that kind of, caught me because i you know that's a lot of even even over the course of my career i always worked at home a bunch and got to spend a lot of time with my kids and raising my kids and that was always super important to me so no that's awesome right yeah. but one one problem i had was um well two problems i had the first problem is uh, i live in a typical asian country and for asian parents um, they're not so keen on you know uh, unusual career paths you know right. they prefer something safer more conservative doctor lawyer engineer you know the usual uh, the usual career yep. paths that guarantee a stable income but uh well that's how i actually got started i i studied hard i got a uh, i got a scholarship with a local oil and gas company it's actually a large multinational corporation and uh i did five years in university got my electrical and engineer uh, electrical and electronics engineering degree uh, did pretty well. Um, so they offered me a job and then started working. Well, at first I started working in a fertilizer plant. Basically, they, they take natural gas and they turn it into fertilizer. And I was, uh, the, uh, I was the maintenance engineer, one of the maintenance engineers. So we made sure you know, the motors are running, uh, the cables are in, in stock, the lights are regularly serviced, the, the usual maintenance stuff, you know, boring, but it puts food on the yeah. table and the pay is pretty good. Uh, and then later on, I, I was yeah. transferred to uh, uh, an onshore terminal where basically that's where they received the oil from the oil platforms and did the same thing. And then um, at that point, I was thinking, the money's good, but it's not really what I want to do with my life, basically. It's not my dream. My dream is you know, stay at home parent. But now I have two problems. The first problem is uh, I need to you know, convince my parents and uh, my spouse that it's possible. Because nobody wants to marry a bum right so <laughs> yeah so the second problem is the problem with being stay home parent is it pays absolutely zero you know, in terms of yep. money so i need a source of income so what i did was i i, I started working on the, the flash games a lot more and then later on i quit my job and then i started this uh my own company and uh this basically gave me a chance to work from home working for myself basically i'm my own employer and uh, the games are actually there to pay for the daily necessities while I look after the kids. So I have three kids now, uh, one daughter and two sons. And yeah, it's great. So yeah. I've survived so far. The, 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 it turns out that I did earn enough to you know, survive these 10 years and hopefully for many years to come. And uh, my parents actually are pretty proud of what I do. And uh, they actually keep track of my games and, you know, give me Facebook likes and uh, they, oh, they ask questions about the games and go like, oh, you know, uh, how did the how did the release trailer go? You know, did people like it? And yeah. They were pretty so I have a question about your 
in that conversation you have with your parents probably multiple times. Sure. But when you said when when they were resistant and said, you know, doctor, lawyer, engineer, were you telling them my dream job is to be a stay at home dad or were you telling them it was to be a video game de developer? Well, at that point, I did have uh, some income from the uh, the flash sponsorships. So I, uh -huh. I showed them you know, the numbers and told them, like, uh, I think this can be translated into a Steam income. And they sort of looked at me and went like, are you going to make Angry Birds? You know, that, that would be a <laughs> frame of reference. So I was like, yes, yes, yes. I'm going to make <laughs> yes. something like I Angry mean... Birds. You know, because there's no point <laughs> you know, going into too much technical details. But yeah, so they basically, for the first few years, they thought I was going to make an Angry Birds clone or something that I didn't really have much of an idea of what I was doing. But later as the game was released and, you know, they, they saw how it went and, you know, they were very supportive. And, and the good thing is I get to meet them every day now. Uh, whereas before this, while I was working, uh, I, only, I only met them maybe twice or three times a year when I fly back. So, yeah, it's actually yeah. great. <laughs> I've always been a are... family-oriented guy. So this has been one of the greatest perks of working for myself. And of course, getting to see the kids grow up, that's priceless. You can't really yeah. put a price on that. But no, you can't. You can put a cost on it, which is you need to pay for food, you need to pay for <laughs> the necessities. So although Pesky you can't put a price on like it, there is a cost to that. So you need to have some kind of income to, you know, to be a realistic right. stay-at-home dad. Right. So far, yeah, things have been working out. So that's, that's pretty amazing. And so for people that aren't familiar, uh, Malaysia is broken up into sort of like two parts. It's almost like, it's almost like Michigan. <laughs> here in the yeah, US. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Except it, instead of a lake, it's it's a, a sea, an ocean, uh, in, right. in between the two parts. And Kuala Lumpur, the capital, is over on, on one side and you're on the other side. Right, we're on the um, island of Borneo. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. and now, when you started uh, to get deeper into games development, um, talk about what the government of Malaysia, uh, how, how they were involved in, because I know you were flying back and forth a little bit, and that gets to a, a part of game development, which I think is is fa fascinating. Um, the, the way different countries handle supporting the arts more than the the U.S. does. So the unusual thing about me is I've always been sort of a hermit. I've always done my own thing, uh, and I was actually kind of oblivious to what everybody else was doing in Malaysia, because uh, for me, I I basically I'm focused on the kids, and this the games have always been a supplement to that, but. Uh, you know, as as the games got bigger, as the income you know started to be more stable, and then uh, I was contacted by a local government agency. It's actually called the uh, Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation (MDEC), and they offered to fly me to KL to give a talk about you know what's like to have a publisher versus self-publishing. So I was I was pretty curious, so I I accepted the offer. They flew me to KL. And then uh, when I was there, I actually, that was the first time I actually had a better idea of what actually was happening with the Malaysian games development scene. So I saw a lot of the, these booths that they were setting up. And it turns out, uh, well, I think most people already knew it, but not me, because you know, I was basically out of the loop for a while. <laughs> uh, we have two, well, at least two major studios. And the Malaysian game industry was basically uh, most well known for being an outsourcing uh, uh, place you know uh place where uh, when whenever somebody wants to make a big game for example uh, spider-man remastered elden ring demon souls so all these studios actually because of the size of their games they actually outsource part of the production to uh, these outfits in malaysia so those that i knew of were like uh, lemon sky studios passion republic and these guys are like you know, basically uh third-party contractors to the the but, major but a big deal developers. I mean, Lemon, Lemon Sky, they, you know, they've done stuff for, I was, I was looking it up, Blizzard, uh, uh, Microsoft, EA, Disney, Nickelodeon, and beautiful, beautiful work. And there's like 450 people that work there at Lemon Sky right now. That's right. So it's, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big industry. Mm -hmm. And so, so to, sort of two things out of that. Um, one is the MDEC uh, was, was fascinating to me. The Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation, which is sort of like a, a government run incubator you know we, we talked a little bit about them supporting game developers i i think is great mm -hmm. and we've we've talked about that with the with the nordic companies that that had support like that coming from the government uh canada does that and i 
I liked, I had been saying that the U.S. doesn't do it at all, but the U.S. Endowment for the Arts actually does a little bit nowadays. Um, I was, I was just looking that up. They have grants, especially if it's an artistic rendition, rendition, they've added video games into a category where they, where they will do grants for it as well. So it's I guess, I guess, I guess the U S does it too, um, mm -hmm. which is great, which is amazing because games are art and games are, are interesting from a number of perspectives. Canada, I know when they they do it, they were doing it more from a technology perspective, the games that push technology forward. Um, so MDEC being a, a key incubator and supporter of, de of developers, I, I think is awesome. Yeah, I think they're doing a great job. They actually support it both directly and indirectly. Uh, they give like direct grants and uh, indirectly, they, or, or they off, uh, what they do is they organize annual ex expos, basically a small expo for local game developers where they can you know, get in touch with other developers. They can show the game that they're working on and it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty useful for the local game developers. Yeah. And pull in experts like you to come in and talk uh, and, really and an sort expert. of like <laughs> educate. Well, now you are. Professional <laughs> amateur, I would say. You're a, you're a senior, a senior in the industry, a, <laughs> a legend. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. It sounds better than how it feels, I guess. Oh, one other sort of side comment. Uh, the, so the, the next thing was Lemon Sky. Mm -hmm. uh, one other side comment on Lemon Sky that I, I looked on their web, web website is if they call themselves Lemonians. Yeah, <laughs> if you, I think if so. you kind of come work there, you could be a Lemonian. Very, um, very talented, very, very hardworking individuals. Yeah, it and it looked amazing. So they've got a couple promo videos where they show them working and they show them in meetings. They show the art and the, the, mm -hmm. the, the studio, which which really looks cool. I wonder, and I don't know if you've got sort of a, a view of this. I what I've found when we've started to see these these places where there's a bigger studio doing a thing or a couple bigger organizations is what tends to happen is small indie studios might spin out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you might get a couple of people that worked at Lemon Sky for, for a while out of those 450, and then they want to go off and, and sort of like build their own studio. Do you see sort of see that happening? Do you think that, you know, that that's going to happen more because there's such awesome talent there. I mean, what, what do you, what do you see, sort of see? From I, perspective? I think that's already happening, but uh, it, it probably takes a while because the lemon, you know, outfits like lemon sky, like passion Republic, they are, their main strength is the high quality you know, assets that they can produce. So um, not, they, they don't so much get involved with the game design side. So the problem with spinning up from that is uh, they don't quite have that experience where, whereas, you know, so sort of like most of the game design is done stateside and then right. basically we're just producing the, the asset. So uh, probably initially uh, people who spin up that way, probably they can produce like very beautiful assets, but it'll take a while to, you know, catch up in terms of game design, in terms of, you know, the, the actual structure of the game. So yeah. um, not that I know of personally, any of them have actually come out because once you leave those studios, you're basically taking on a huge risk uh, you're you're gonna you know, you're gonna pay for your own salary. You're gonna not. Yeah. It's, it's not everyone's cup of tea because sometimes, uh, although you know all the success stories that you tend to see in the media would be small outfits, maybe solo developers or two or three guys. But uh, what we don't see is all those that don't work out. So the right, the right. reason most of them don't work out is because it is actually very difficult to to survive to produce something. And yeah. And, and those are the, those the are the outliers. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, a little, little bit of real talk for, for people that are out there thinking of going off and, and doing their own thing. It, you know, it's, it's definitely worth it to, to pursue if you're in a position where you can pursue it, but you got to realize that the downside, the risks and the reality of, you know, strike, you know, striking it rich or, you know, getting, you know, becoming the next, you know, whatever. The, yeah. you know, angry birds. Yeah. The next <laughs> angry birds. Uh, don't, uh, I would say you got to have the expectation that those are outliers. As, right. as Even I'm an outlier, suggested. to be honest, because whenever, whenever people come to me and say, like, oh, how can I be a, an indie developer? I would actually start out with, you really have to know the risk that you're taking. And it is definitely a high risk, high reward situation because, you know, uh, if you start your own studio, you basically keep all the profits. But the downside is you're going to have, so have to absorb all the costs and there is no guarantee of success. And you're going to have to keep adapting to the changing market. And sometimes it takes years and years of labor on the game. And if it doesn't work out, you basically 
uh, you're, you're basically set back a lot. You're basically, uh, you're giving up future income and you, you know, you've already paid for like years of your own. Yeah. Time. Well, I, I mean, I see it like, even though you're very, very good at base basketball, your chances of being in the NBA are very low, right. or you could be an excellent writer, but you, the chances of being the next Stephen King are very, very low. Right. It's just, yeah. 1% of the people make that. Yeah. Maybe now less the, than 1%. Yeah. Now the, yeah. the positive side is the games industry is continuing to grow mm-hmm. and is, is huge and continuing to get, to get bigger. So it's not as precarious a position as trying to become an NBA basketball player. <laughs> there's, there's, well, because there's, there's a finite couple, number of yeah, them. A couple hundred but, of yeah. those guys. Um, but, but, but it's still, it's still a, a big challenge and it takes a lot of work and it might not be the first game. And then you got to learn and you got to iterate and you got to keep evolving and going. And we were going to save the, the red queen discussion in, until later, but I think it kind of fits right here. Mm-hmm. The, the, well, why don't you introduce the red queen hypothesis and we'll, we'll, we'll throw it back and forth. Cause I think right. that gets so, that idea. So before going into that red queen hypothesis, run. what I would like to say is my focus uh, running my studio has always been survival because, uh, you know, I, I've, I've read a lot of stories. I've seen the actual numbers and it is actually difficult to just survive. So yeah. uh, if you actually see the numbers, what the, the thousands of games released, most of them don't even make a thousand dollars, one thousand dollars. Right. Right. So right. Th- those are like really shocking numbers and uh, something that, you know, may- maybe uh, new developers are either not aware of or they are convinced that they're not going to be, you know, part of that group. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Most even, of the success like is concentrated at the game. top. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, I, I heard numbers around even a small mobile, mobile game. And maybe maybe you're putting this amount of effort in or you're contracting pieces out. But it can be around 50 grand to, to you know, to put a game together in terms right. of, of effort and time and advertising and publishing. And so to only make $1,000 back, that's, that's a little that's bit rough. That's way gotta, below minimum yeah. wage. That's a, yes, exactly. it is. <laughs> <laughs> so what, one of the things that, you know, uh, most studios, uh, they, um, well, for me anyway, time is actually uh, a cost. You know, every, every month that you spend on a game, you're going to have to pay for your expenses. And yeah. Uh, uh, and one of the things that I read, because I read a lot of uh, different ideas on Reddit, on Twitter, one of those things that stood out to me was what they called the Red Queen Hypothesis. This was basically from uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, at least in Wonderland book, where one of the lines says, you know, running as fast as you can just to stay exactly where you are. So this was actually brought into, a, you know, it's actually an evolutionary biology where they say it doesn't matter how long the species has survived, its chances of not going extinct does not improve. Which means uh, even, you know, a new species or a species that has been there for a long time, they have equal chances of going extinct if they do not adapt to the changing situations, which means the, your, you know, your, the, your existence, the length of your existence is not as big as advantage as you might think. So right. yeah, for studios like me, I've seen a lot of changes in the industry. Imagine if I had just stuck to Flash, I would probably be gone by now because you know, the industry right. changed. And then uh, even Steam is changing. There's uh, new game stores coming up. There's new technologies coming up. You know, we've seen like chat GPT. We've seen the rise of AI and the big argument around AI art versus uh, human art. And this is definitely going to spill over into game development sooner or later because I, I think it's only a matter of time before you have, you know, algorithms, those black box machine learning uh, AI, yeah. yeah, churning out games as well. So, of course, initially, yeah. the quality might not quite be there, but they are improving at an astonishing rate. So, Basically, you survive uh, only if you adapt to the changes. And uh, the Redcoin hypothesis is interesting because it also says while you are adapting, all your competitors are adapting as well. And if they adapt faster than you, you will actually be pushed up. Falling behind. Not through any fault yeah, of your own. Going backwards. Yeah, you've then, done your best, yeah. but just because somebody else did better, you, know, you can actually be left behind. And we've seen this in quite a lot of you know, collapses, collapse of, for example, uh, Westwood in the past. Everyone thought they were untouchable and you know, eventually they folded. Yep. So, yeah. Quite yeah. a lot of these I'm, horror stories. So as much as I can. It happened in the music industry with rec- the big record companies. Instead of adapting to new technology, they tried to 
squash it and that didn't work. Exactly, with the rise of music streaming. Uh, almost all industries will face this, any business. Even even a you know like the podcast, your your podcast is a very recent thing. So it used to be, you know, the traditional media had a monopoly on sharing all these ideas, but now anyone can set up a podcast and you can share and disseminate interesting ideas. And this actually cuts into the what we call the attention economy that you know they had a yeah. Yeah, most of these corporations had a grip on. And now it's being broken up by YouTube, by Twitch, by you know, Apple Podcasts. By... Basically, yeah, it's, it's, it's an industry it's, that's forever changing. It's, a, it's, a big, it's, a, it's almost a bigger problem for the big players because you get into a situation which is known as the innovator's dilemma, where right. if they are a first mover, if they do have a market leading position based on some innovation that they had, what they'll, their, the problem that they'll run into is as the environment changes, they'll they'll need to sacrifice their innovation, their leading position in their innovative space because that's no longer what's where where the market is headed. Mm-hmm. And it's very, very difficult for a organization that's making, you know, billions of dollars, you know, like Microsoft, making billions of dollars off of Windows as a boxed product to say, okay, well, maybe we're not going to make any revenue off of Windows anymore. Maybe it's all going to be web services and Azure and the cloud. They did that. They got over that. But it's very, very difficult. But what's the next thing for Microsoft? Right. And, and it will continue. Right. Yeah. Like, now, if you're small and agile, mm-hmm. then maybe you can change more rapidly. But you need to change, right? That's right. That's one of my that. favorite <laughs> analogies. Uh, you know, can you imagine the big publishing studios as large dinosaurs, carnivores, T-Rex, uh, brachiosauruses? You know, that whenever you think of dinosaurs, you think of all these large, strong yep. creatures. Mm-hmm. But meanwhile, uh, there are niches in the ecosystem where smaller indie developers can survive. People like me, where we're more like the small mammals that, you know, we, we, we live in the corners, we hide in the shadows, but we survive. We survive meteors. Right. Yeah. So there is, a, there is a line that I read, which is very interesting, which is uh, nature's tendency to make creatures bigger is only matched by nature's tendency to kill large creatures. So how it works is uh, um, whenever there is a competition in an evolutionary, you know, in an in a, in a ecosystem, uh, the large creatures tend to win. They tend to dominate. So you see a lot of the apex predators are large. They, are, you know, they, are, they get bigger and bigger because it gives them a big advantage. But on the other hand, it causes their energy cost to go up. So they need to constantly yeah. feed. And whenever the environment changes, these large creatures are the slowest to adapt because of their size. So yeah, mm-hmm. it, it actually translates over very well into business, into games, into even you know yeah. uh, the entertainment industry where you tend to get bigger because the bigger players have all the advantages. They have uh, economies of scale. They have yeah, they have access to resources. They have lobbies. But when the when the industry changes, it takes a long time for them to move because of the sheer you know inertia that they have. So right. Yeah, it's similar to what I tend to see in whenever you read about like biology. So, and if if there's a big enough disruption, they will be the the first ones to die because they do need to be consuming so much just exactly. in terms of revenue to support that big of an organization. Mm-hmm. If there's any sort sort of significant disruption, it will it will kill a big company before it will kill a smaller, more agile right. competitor. So, yeah, how it works is ex- just imagine the dinosaurs. As long as the status quo remains, the large animals will dominate. So the large organizations will dominate. But the moment something changes, and the more drastic the change, the more likely these large things are wiped out. So, for example, meteor strike, sudden change of weather overnight, uh, you know, all these things will actually eliminate the large animals first. Whereas something like the cockroach has survived for millions of years just by being a cockroach. <laughs> You know, it's not we glamorous. We all but... aspire to be the cockroach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's definitely not glamorous, but you know, I don't think the cockroach minds because it survives. While we're on the topic, because this is fascinating, what you know, I think you you've mentioned a couple things already. What do you see as the potential big meteors coming for the gaming industry uh, that that are that are rocketing through the the either the stratosphere or are out there in space coming coming for us? I mean, you right, mentioned so... AI. I, I yeah. do not I don't like to make predictions because um right 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 you know <laughs> these things tend to backfire on you and uh, there's this concept from the financial field called you know they call the black swan events I'm sure you've heard of black swan yes. events are events that nobody predicted but they totally changed the 
the industry or the playing field. So uh, the thing about Black Swan events is they're unpredictable. Nobody right. can see them coming. So large companies, I think uh, for Facebook, for Amazon, they try to anticipate these by trying all sorts of different things. So you have, I think the Fire Phone, Alexa, all these were experiments in case the market changes. Even Apple, you can see they, they venture into like Apple TV. They're looking at Apple Car. So it's, it's sort of a way for large companies to try and anticipate these un, unpredictable Black Swan events. But by their very nature, nobody can see them coming. Maybe five years ago, nobody would be even predict that machine learning can advance to a point where you can declare them as AI and nobody questions it. Right. Right. To be honest, like ChatGPT is not really an AI. It's yeah. basically yeah. A, a black box that you, know, you, you give or, it. Or the, the definition of AI isn't what people, people think. It's not, right. it's not AGI. We're nowhere near right. AG, artificial exactly. general intelligence right. where you could have something that is you know, self-defining and self-improving. And right. that, that doesn't exist. That's science fiction. But imagine if, if AGI actually appears, you know, like, like as in Rogue AI Simulator. If it appears, even next week, the whole world would change overnight. Yes, all of us will have to adapt. Yeah, Basically, we all be out of a job, for example. So now that's not even one that I would I would predict because that would be the, pretty the, terrifying. The, the, yeah. The flip side of predictions is you can have like a random conversation like this, and you could you could predict whatever, uh -huh. and none of them will come true. But if one does, then you can clip that out in the future and say, "See, I was yes. right." Right. You'd be like, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> the virus so we'll bias now. of the predictions. Artificial general intelligence is going to change the game industry. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, think that, I mean, a whole game around it. You should buy my game. <laughs> well, yeah, Rogue AI. Oh, the future. <laughs> so Rogue AI, to, you know, 2.0, you'll, you'll partner with an AI mm -hmm. to, make Rogue, the, to make the new AI game. Yeah, um, that'll, be, that'll be pretty creepy, yeah. And that AI's dream job would have been to be a stay-at-home AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And to, to raise, to raise to... new baby AIs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. See, uh, um, I, I cannot actually predict the future for the gaming industry because I remember when Steam first came out, uh, for those of us old enough, it first came out as a way to deliver Half-Life 2 to our computers. And it was a right. mess. The launch was terrible. I mean, if you can remember yep. that far back. I remember when it first Steam came out, everyone was like, what? You need to be online all the time to play games? That's ridiculous. They're forcing us. I, want forcing yes. thing. I, just want the I remember, and, yeah, yeah, people going, what? No, yeah, yeah. I don't want to. The servers were overloaded and then everyone's like, Steam sucks, you know. But now, basically, everyone is trying to be on Steam and uh, all the other competitors yep. are there to pull business away from Steam. So that's how fast things can change. And uh, I thought it was a long time ago, but when I checked back, it wasn't as long as I thought or I'm um, Maybe I'm just getting older, so yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. It seems like another era. Yeah. That's why right. it seems like a long exactly. ago. Yeah. Right. Well, most, things most players, I think, would not even be old enough to remember the time when Steam was actually universally hated. It's actually, right. yeah, there was a time. but Or when Steam didn't exist. I yeah, mean, exactly. <laughs> when, when, when there I was a time when you know, games. GameStop was the only way to deliver your games to players. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Or or when the source code was printed in the back of Bike Magazine, and that was the only way to, to get the and game out there. Even GameStop themselves have always adapted, and uh, you know they they went from like kind a, of a retailer to secondhand games seller to basically a meme stock now, and you know it's, it's right, right. I, that's this. that's weird. I, yeah. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have put this in put them in the category of somebody who was adapting, uh -huh. but they they got into that weird place. Where they became a meme stock, yeah, and I've... we'll see, we'll see. They 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 kind of embraced it, which I think was the right thing to do. Uh -huh. But who could and have seen that coming, right? It's like no, yeah, yeah. Well, that yeah, that's a completely weird thing, and that I that was a micro disruption to financial the financial industry, which I don't think is going to persist. I, I, yeah, that, that's like that it's was like a bottle. I think that's going to happen uh -huh. again. But even that uh, so, changed a lot of things, so we won't actually see the effects until the years to come so with with all of this with the red queen hypothesis and the 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 tiny tiny mammals running in between in the feet of the dinosaurs uh where do you see where do you see you in the you know moving forward are you going right. to continue to to run to 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 you know to, to be a do you have more flash like, like games <laughs> in your catalog to to fill out the or odd numbers yeah. going so, forward so for me like i said my focus is just to survive so right now uh Rogue AI, the, the wishlist numbers are doing pretty well. Um, I mean, well within predicted range. 
and hopefully it'll it'll sell okay. And from there, I just gotta see where I'm going. Uh, maybe to three games. Sooner or later, I may have to hire you know additional employees. But that doing that, I risk becoming a larger mammal. Uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, do you ever think maybe the solution is to train your children to be three D graphic <laughs> artists? That that'll be uh probably breaking quite a few child labor laws. So. <laughs> but they do watch me as I code. But uh, you know, for now, I just tell them, you know, stay in school, kids. That this is interesting for you. But you know, uh, they watch me as I code, and I I do show them how things are done. So it may be an advantage to them in the future, but it may not be. It depends on what they do right. when they grow up. You know, as parents, I think that's the right attitude to have. As parents, all of... we can do is just do our best. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, provide the tools. Huh? Pushing right. pushing a kid in a particular direction is a sure way, surefire way to get them to not do that. Thing. Exactly. So Providing for me, the, the I tend to encourage their creativity in general. I, I don't like yeah. not force them to. You must learn coding, blah blah blah. I just give them basically a stack of paper, lots of crayons and pens, and endless supply of stationery. They can just draw whatever they want, and you know, we'll see where that brings them in the future. I believe that. That that they learn problem solving by doing that too. Yes, I think so. And creativity is very important. An, yeah, a nice, fun, ethical way around the child labor laws <laughs> that I find very, very useful is kids are great at uh, creativity and new ideas too. So right. I love, I, I I always love talking to my kids and like brainstorming stuff. And I'm sure you'll you'll be doing this as well. And <laughs> what what they like, what they're into, hearing. Hearing from them and maybe getting a glimpse ahead into, you know, what's 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 hot, what's interesting, what are the new ways that kids like to play, and being able to incorporate incorporate that into the projects that you're working on is probably a, a fun thing. I, to be okay, to. if I have to make a prediction, you know, if you hold me at gunpoint and force me doing a prediction, I would say the future of the game industry is heavily dependent on the overall attention economy itself. Because sometimes okay. you tend to see the game industry as you know a standalone monolith by itself, but that's not true. We are actually part of what we call the entire attention economy, with yep. Netflix, with you know, um, with mm-hmm. Disney Plus, with movies, TikTok. with yeah, all these things. Right. So one of the things that I've noticed among my kids and their peers is a, a shift towards short form content. You know, with the rise of TikTok and uh, with all these mm-hmm. uh, YouTube shorts, so they tend to 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 prefer short form content. So I, I I do wonder if that will translate into games in the future where perhaps it may create a generation where they do not want 60 hour open world games like the big companies are producing now. So what if they want like smaller bite-sized content in games as well because that is how the attention has been shaped from a younger age. So as these kids grow up uh, and and they you know they start earning money in the future and they become consumers perhaps, I don't know for sure, but perhaps they would prefer shorter form content rather than, you know, just a single game that you play for 120 hours, which is what we used to like. So, yeah, right. So or, that, or, that may yeah. be, yeah, there may be a one of ways to predict the future is to look at it as a whole where we are part of, yeah, they call it the attention economy. Basically, attention is a, commo- is a, is a resource that everyone is fighting for right now. That's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think that's something that everybody could probably benefit from just brainstorming and thinking about yeah. because maybe there's ways to take it in different directions within the, you know, the persistent open world to still adapt that idea of the short form attention right. experience. The, the bites, <laughs> bite sized. Within that, exactly. it, it might be a direction to go. Or, yeah. I mean, th- this is why I, I believe that Fortnite became such a, a, a phenomenon because it took something, it took that first person shooter idea and boiled it down into something that sort of really latched on to the hey, we've got <laughs> sorry <laughs> bring, bring him in no he can he can come and say hi yeah absolutely hello he, he got bored of come, come in and help sucking. help brain help brainstorm <laughs> um so your, your son jumping there in the camera for the people that are listening in audio that was that was awesome um but but yeah you got you got Fortnite, which took that idea and boiled it into something that really adapted to to some degree, to that uh, that attention uh, um, attention economy, mm-hmm. because it was shorter shorter rounds, and it also then even when you got knocked out, 
puts you in the position where you your attention was still grabbed by the by watching the finishing of the round. So you're still consuming. Content. Right. And not only that, but and they then, constantly introduce new content with the, the new skins mm-hmm. that they have. And it, the content tend to be wildly different from one another, you know, with the and you know, it links to the whole meme meme thing where they yeah. have, like different memes arising from Fortnite itself. So yeah, I do believe they they do have a grasp of what the future is the future brings and how to capitalize on that. So that and I I wonder if it's potentially even going to go further though too. It in in the same way that we went from you know shorter blog posts and shorter videos down to you know TikToks and YouTube Shorts, which are just seconds long. I wonder if there'll be a, a further evolution or at least a segment of of games that even go further that are these you know super super short, quick hit meme generated things uh, right. that haven't even been invented yet. Maybe on the flip side, it could go full circle and maybe in the yeah. future people Sick. prefer yeah. long form content again because of the right. constant saturation of yes. you know short form content so it's, there's no way to predict which right. way I do believe those yeah in cyclical trends like that yeah yes. you can see like how the 80s fashion comes and goes and you know right oh. well right. So it's this like, first of all you know we're going to centralize and then five years later, it's decentralized. Right. And then five years later, it's and centralized. And then we're back to like all the advantage of centralization because, yeah, that's how it so, right. goes. So we'll be, we'll be so talking good. about you know, like Fortnite and TikTok and, you know, and the kids two generations from now be going, okay, boomer, with your yeah. Fortnite <laughs> and your TikTok. <laughs> Fortnite. Wow. There, there was a time when yeah. Facebook was super cool, but yeah, like grandparents play Facebook, now they'd be like, Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> right. Hence the name change to Meta, I guess, and the constant need to adapt. So they are well aware of the Red Queen hypothesis there, I'm sure. Yep. But I, I mean, I'm I'm thinking too now. Like we, we talk sometimes about VR and AR, but I I almost already don't have patience for that because I don't want to do the research to figure out what to buy, uh-huh. and I don't want to figure out which games are good, to, you know, with it or whatever. And uh, yeah, I've I've always felt that VR was a sort of a dead end tech um, for me personally. Because of the friction mm-hmm. between the player and the game. You know, first of all, there's the yep. friction. You're going to buy that expensive VR headset. And then secondly, you know, once you're in the game, uh, there's a the constant feeling that you know, you're, you're trapped somewhere else rather than you're, you're, you're in the game. So Yeah, that's, yeah. that's one we that, could probably do are, a whole episode on. Because I, yeah. I, I, <laughs> yes. I think you're absolutely but right. Those are, those are the, definitely the friction points for VR. Yeah, right. I feel like it's friction. And that idea of, of the friction, I think, is, is key there. But yes. I don't think it is necessarily something that we can't get around. Um, no, they don't, don't have to hurt. solve it. But I've always believed, like, for example, Flash was so popular because of the lack of friction. Right. So easy to play. It's so easy. And not only that, recently I was doing some... Uh, Chinese videos in China to promote Rogue AI Simulator. And surprisingly, most of them have actually played my Flash games. So I was like, huh. what? I was like, why? How? <laughs> how? How did that even work? Because my games were in English and I, I was not aware that people in China were playing it. But it turns out they have these pirated Flash sites in their school computer labs and that's where they actually played the game because of how easy it was to you know copy Flash games. Oh, that's, yeah. that's uh, fascinating. So that, that lack of friction is actually it's actually a bigger factor than you might expect because the fact that it's so easy to copy and it's so easy to play uh, means that some people that I never expected to have played my game actually are, are aware of what I've been doing. And you know, I was completely taken by surprise. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I, I had no idea you guys played my games. So yeah, that was... That, that, was a, that reminds me of back, back in the early days of tech, there were rumors. I don't think it was ever really a business strategy, but the software that was pirated often was tacitly tacitly allowed and tacitly a- approved because it got the distribution of that software then out wider and wider and wider. Yeah. Uh, so e- even Microsoft and, and Windows, it's just sort of pr- proliferating and proliferating, you know, and then then later on down the road, those people turn into paying customers because right. it just sort of gets out there and the friction because it's already out there is, is eliminated and you right. don't have to have big license agreements or big you know, you have to buy a big piece of hardware with it or like buying a mainframe. It was just sort of like spreading out there everywhere. And one one know. thing that I love about game development is how it relates to all the unrelated fields that you would think is unrelated. Mm-hmm. So for example, the concept of friction itself for a, for a game designer like me, it is very important because if you have played Rogue AI, I've tried to reduce friction as much as possible. There are no long cut scenes, you know, it gets you into the action as fast as possible. 
it tries to give you the option to skip all the uh, dialogue if you want to. So basically, good game designers, they try to eliminate friction as much as possible. So this concept is actually uh, surprisingly, um, surprisingly foreign to maybe people outside of the field. But for game developers like me, we're going to be aware of all these trends. What's survivorship bias? What is friction? What is the concept of, you know, how to make something feel fun, which is basically uh, the psychology part of it. So it's a constant balancing act between uh, hard science and soft science, which is it's very fascinating. Yeah. I really enjoy the challenge. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel it all the time when I'm looking at a new game. It's sort of mm-hmm. like, we used to call it the new player experience, but it, it's like, don't tell me how to play the game. Tell me why I want to play the game or show me why I want to play the game. And then I'll figure out later how to play it. Right. Yeah. And, and the the game should should lead you through it. And, mm-hmm. and it, it should be a natural experience. I shouldn't have to go to school and learn, you know, learn the, the go to go to class and watch the videos <laughs> to learn how to play your game. <laughs> It, the game should it ex- explain itself to me. Right. Um, That's what I heard about. This is what I really dislike about typical starting zones in a, in a, like an MMO or yeah. a, a big AAA game. It's sort of like, I, I don't want to be in school to learn this game. I just want to go out there. Yeah. Right. Well, hey, this, this conversation has, has been amazing and wide ranging. So you, you said yeah. you're, you're not an expert in the field, but you've touched on so many key salient topics and points that it, I mean, we're, we're throwing more out here. People should just go and research every one of these sort of like phrase, yes. survivorship bias. And you know, each one of these things, people need to, if you, if you want to sort of like learn what the, what the reality of the, of what underpins the craft. Um, I, I, I think this is, In, this is great. interestingly, I would say, right. Just, just as a short, short by note, I would say we are actually very similar to the finance field because finance is also a mix of soft science and hard science. And, a lot of seemingly unrelated things from you know evolutionary biology, whatever, also applies to finance as well. So uh, we are we are probably the closest adjacent industry to to that, where you know keep the game industry and finance, which you know look at it, they're probably like completely different from each other, but they have a lot more in common but than you would think. The the under you know some of those underpinning concepts of that I I think are are is definitely true. The the macro aspects of the industry where the like the velocity of how fast things change is is right. definitely much different <laughs> and the the ratio of dinosaurs to small mammals is different <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> there's many more dinosaurs in in financial services and it moves much slower from an evolutionary perspective um, for a good reason and by the way uh-huh. yeah. dinosaurs were very successful yeah you know for, for a long very, time they are still long successful time. their descendants are chickens and they are one of the you know most yeah. most populous animals in the world right now because of how Sharks. delicious they are. So I guess even their descendants are very <laughs> successful. We breed. I, I do find them delicious. Also, <laughs> <laughs> well, on that on the, on that final note, dinosaurs are delicious. I th- I think we'll wrap it up. But as I said, this this has been amazing. I love the the journey that you've been on, the dream job that you've carved out for yourself, and I think that's aspirational. Everybody can sort of think think hard about what do you really want to do and how do you make that happen um and then the realities and i i, I love that that like the, the red queen hypothesis and, and that kind of thing so i'm really excited for the launch of, of rogue ai simulator and and, I and s- what's next say well, whatever's coming next congratulations right. on that and yes Thank i you. think we'll need to stay very close because you've got this rapid pace of development. So I know we're going to see new things relatively soon as well. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoy having talks like this where you can share ideas and yeah. Well, then we will do it again. We will do it again. Definitely want to touch bases again. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This has been a New Overlords production. For more, please visit newoverlords.com for video, subscribe and feed links, and other ways to help the show.